well, what a treat. Isn't it amazing what a few orders of magnitude difference can do in our thinking? Um, the light from the Milky Way being considered so close compared to the rest. Or rather than projecting the next 10 years of what's going to happen, we now know what will happen 5 billion years from now. Um, so this gives me a chance to introduce our next speaker, Virginia Lee. Um, Virginia is a professor in Alzheimer's research at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She's also the director of the Center of Neurodegenerative Disease and co-director of the uh, uh, Center for Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Program at the university. Um, she's working in neurodegeneration. She's the winner of this year's uh, Breakthrough Prize in the Life Sciences. Um, her work has shown that uh, components from different cells can aggregate and cause, be the cause of neurodegenerative disease. And most importantly, in her work, as she's going to talk to us about today, um, this does not st stay within the cell in which the proteins are being produced, but rather the aggregated proteins get transmitted and become foci for neurodegenerative events. And I think to put her work in perspective, um, it is really important that these advances being made in the academic sciences and being driven forward in academia because major pharmaceutical companies, including Pfizer, um, have discontinued their work on Alzheimer's because the time frame in which these uh, uh, progress, the progress would become uh, financially viable for them has just been too long. So this is very important work for the benefit of all of us. So her order, her, her title is Transmission of Misfolded Proteins in Neurodegenerative Disorders. Where do we go from here? Please join me in welcoming Virginia to the stage. Thank you very much for your introduction. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. And um, I actually um, have something to do with UCSF. I got my PhD at UCSF, but not on this campus. And I remember Bill Rudder, we're in the Bill Rudder um, building. And um, shortly after I arrived as a graduate student, Bill Rudder became the chair of biochemistry at uh, UCSF. So it gives me very fond, fond memory um, of the place. So, um, okay, so that's the slide. So what I like to do is really to um, summarize for you in the first part of my talk. And, um, and of the field of uh, the advances in um, um, neurodegenerative disease research, which is this whole concept of cell-to-cell -cell transmission of pathological protein aggregates. And um, we think that it's a common mechanism and for neurodegenerative disease progression. And then what I like to do is to, the theme of this meeting is how do we use that information to really look into the future and see how we can develop potential effective therapies. And so you are very familiar with the pathology in neurodegenerative diseases. And um, on the left side, I don't know whether I can, no, I don't think I can use my, uh, my husband was very kind, gave me a, a pointer, but I don't think it'll work. But in any case, um, so on the upper, uh, uh, for me, is left side. So it's uh, the, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, basically, <laughs> is plaques and tangles. <laughs> Thank you. And, and then um, on, next to it is the uh, Lewy body, which is the major pathology of Parkinson's disease that are comprised of alpha-synuclein. And you can see below that, and there's just pathology, that are called TDP-403, the ubiquinated TDP-403, that accumulate in ALS and FTD. So these are, we want to define the pathology. So we actually extract um, brains and then isolate the pathology and then sequence it and then uh, give it a molecular phase. And um, so, but um, a lot of work had been done in the last 30, 40 years, and particularly the work of Brock, which really, and um, using human brain to address the whole issue of progression of these neurodegenerative diseases. You can see here that what he did was that he looked at brains with different amount of pathology. Then basically he was able to show that the pathology spread in a stereotypical fashion. 
and so as the disease progresses, you can see, for example, uh, with tau tangles, and earlier on when the disease starts to begin, and the pathology is in the locus cerulis, and then it then move to the limbic system, and then you can see started moving up to the frontal cortex and eventually to the rest of the brain. And so, so they all progress in a different way, but in a stereotypical fashion for each pathology. And another very important piece of information and in the human, from the human side, and we appreciate that there are many, many, many clinical entities, diseases, that have tau pathology in the brain. And obviously, Alzheimer's disease is the most common, most knowledgeable, and most abundant. And then there are a, a number of these diseases. Some of them are very boutique, and they really very, very rare. But they give us a window, an insight into the pathogenesis of tauopathies. And they're all collectively known as tauopathies. And so based on what I just said to you, that um, there are these, um, they, they transmit, and then there's possibility of different kinds of clinical phenotype and suggesting that they may be strains. So we put forward two different hypotheses to test in, in mouse models. And the transmission hypothesis is that the pathology can spread from cell to cell in mouse model. And the strain hypothesis is that the different types of pathology from different human brains and, uh, and accounts for different strains and they, um, they progress to cause disease in um, a different manner, similar to the human. So that, those are the hypotheses that we wanted to test. And so basically, of all the work that we've had been done by many different laboratories, I think that we can demonstrate the phenomenon of cell-to-cell -cell spread as shown in this schematic. And so you can imagine that there's a bad cell that with the misfolded protein, and they've been affected. And you can also imagine that this um, misfolded to transmit so this misfolded protein must somehow get out of the cell. And then somehow it gets taken up by a healthy cell that it talks to. So it's not really neighboring, but it's the cells that they communicate with. And then, and then corrupt it to form the bad form, as you can see there. And then basically what you can imagine is that there are many different points of interference or intervention. So you can block the release of this misfolded protein. You can actually block the uptake of this misfolded protein in the healthy cell, and then you can actually prevent expansion, prevent seeding inside the cell, and you can actually even, and on the outside, and when it gets out of the cell, you can promote degradation of these misfolded seeds. So there are many different ways you can attack the disease. And also, as I mentioned, that there are these strains, the strains, and they're from patient's brain, they're capable of producing the um, neuropathology in, in, in model system, and then, um, so these strains, as I mentioned, they have different seeding properties and different cell type specificities. And so, so how, do we, how do we begin? And so the first thing we need to do is to understand and a little bit about the different stages of Alzheimer's disease or different neurodegenerative diseases using Alzheimer's as an example. And I want you to focus on the top part of the slides. And so you can see that, you know, that one of the things that we learned in the last 10, 15 years is that Alzheimer's disease pathology starts really very early, way before symptom onset. You can see here that, um, that greater than 30 years, you can see that already beta amyloid and started to um, aggregate and then accumulate. Then eventually it caused a, a number of downstream consequences, including the formation of tau pathology and other type of pathology, and also um, and causing a, a dysfunction and of complex cellular uh, uh, um, functions. And also that you can see that on the, on the other side of the slide, and this um, progression and the initiation and progression are actually influenced by risk factors such as genetic risk factors and or time, so you know, aging, and also the environment and, and, and many other factors. And so how do we begin? So because this is such a big disease and it's been around for so long that actually there are many, many attempts to try to uh, treat uh, Alzheimer's disease. You can see that in this very busy um, diagram, there are, I want you to focus on the outside. There are really three major approaches and that people have taken so far. And um, you can develop disease-modifying small molecules, for example. You can also, um, and, and I think that earlier on there's symptomatic treatment. So then after that, 
then you can develop disease-modifying small molecules or um, disease-modifying and immunotherapy, which really right now currently is the most viable therapy. You can see on the top part of the, um, of the slide that, um, that at the, right in the center are those molecules that I've talked about the beta amyloid in the rat in phase three clinical trial. And you can see that there are not that many clinical trials that are ongoing for tau. So that's one area of research that we really need to focus on and develop better therapies. And so what are the, the many different impediments for developing um, disease modifying therapy? And so first of all, we need to find some molecule that is relatively safe and affordable and so on. And, um, and also that, the, you know, because they, these are chronic disease, so um, the cost of the clinical trials and also the length of time needed to enroll these patients and also the length of time to actually observe efficacy are just really long. And also we don't have good ways of monitoring and um, um, predicting, predicting progression and also even assessing risk. And these diseases are extremely complex, as I said. And we also need better insight into the mechanism of brain fa failure. We also need better animal models. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of better animal models that, that are being developed right now. And there are also comorbid, or comorbid conditions. And, um, and also, we don't really know uh, some of the biological underpinning of these non-genetic factors as well. And so there are multiple things that, that really influence and our ability to develop effective therapies. And so, but these are some of the approaches that, that, that we in the field have come up with so far. And basically the first is, no, is no, a no brainer, you eliminate the pathology. And the second is that you now, you know, there, there are already some known risk factors around. So perhaps we can then modify the pathways and then to reduce the pathology. And then finally, the pathology causes a lot of neuroinflammation and perhaps even neuroinflammation could be the primary cause. So we're doing, reducing neuroinflammation is another approach. And then obviously we need to have successful brain aging. And so, so this is a, just a, a slide to show you the model that we've developed, and this is in wild-type non-transgenic mice, where we can take some of the Alzheimer tangle from an Alzheimer brain and inject it in the brain of these mice, and you can see that the pathology and the human pathology can induce normal tau protein to form pathology much like, much like those in the human brain. So this is really very useful model for a lot of things. So what can we do with this? And so obviously you can use immunotherapy, use antibodies that would capture and remove the pathology and the pathological pr protein as they being spread from cell to cell. And then the other technology you can use is anti-sense. You can reduce the level of tau of the, of the bad gene and that, that, that create the pathology. And then you can also use some small molecule drugs that can reduce expression and or facilitate degradation of the pathology. And so this is the genetic factor. So basically, like many diseases, people have done many GWAS and genome-wide association study, and they come up with many different hits. And APOE is one of the, um, the risk factors that are being um, uh, targeted right now. And I want to show you another gene. This is a, a collaboration between our, our lab and, and Dr. Jerry Schellenberg's lab that they identified a, a, a gene they call mammalian suppressor of tauopathy, or MSUC2. And this is a, a, um, a, a zinc finger a binding protein regulate an mRNA. And then you can see now that here that, um, and if you take, uh, inject the AD tau that I just mentioned into a mouse model without MSUC2. So you reduce, you, re, we, you get rid of MSUC2. And so in theory, if you get rid of this gene, if this gene facilitate aggregation, then you should have less pathology. And indeed, this is what we found. And you can see that there are more pathology in the wild type, wild type compared to the knockout, knockout. So there's one approach is to address this risk factor. And the second is that, um, is to um, um, and address the neuroinflammation in these brains. And so one of the genes that has been identified is very important and uh, it's this uh, gene called TREM2, and this is a microglial gene. And um, if you, 
and knock it out, it's not functional, and the mutation have been found on TREMP2 in Alzheimer patients. You can see that in the top panels below, you can see that in the knockout mice, there are a lot more beta amyloid accumulation. This is, again, injecting AD tau into APP transgenic mice. You see that both the knockout and also the mutant result in high accumulation of um, uh, 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 Alzheimer uh, pathology in these mouse brain. So in conclusion, and um, we show that, and many people have shown too, that pathological protein aggregates from patients' brains and with neurogenic diseases induce progressive cell-to-cell -cell specific spread and uh, in wild-type mice that rec recapitulate the human and counterparts and that our study provide novel insights into the pathogenesis of the disease and then identify uh, new targets for future therapy, including combination therapy. And I can't stress that enough that combination therapy is what will be needed to cure uh, neurodegenerative disease. Just Alzheimer's disease, there's so many different the two at least two different pathology. So you need multiple um, treatment, multiple therapy given to the patient at the same time. And this is, I know that it's taboo for the pharmaceutical industry, but it's a road that we need to go and in order to um, and re re retard the onset or de delay the onset or reduce um, the severity of the disease. So basically, um, this is my, uh, the end is that, that these transmission of these protein and it's a common mechanism of progression. So before I finish, I want to thank the people in the lab that did all the work. So the people on uh, chopping that column are all the people that actually conduct the research and uh, first author of some of the papers. And then the people on the other side are people, are the supportive staff in our, um, um, in our center. And um, the work that I've presented are done in collaboration with John Chojanowski and our funding sources at the bottom. Thank you for your attention. So what's known about um, other, other uh, entities like RNA or other proteins that may be traveling with the tau tangles that are taken up by other cells? So you mean uh, RNA? Uh, right. So, so in um, frontal temporal uh, degeneration of FTD and also ALS, TDP43 is an RNA binding protein. So there's a whole host of diseases related to ALS that are uh, it involves RNA binding protein and, and HNRPs, for example. And so, yes, so um, for that, those diseases are pretty well established. But for Alzheimer's and um, for Parkinson's disease, I think that it's, you know, people are studying, trying to, to see how these pathology uh, or other factors, you know, impact on, on RNA metabolism. A vaccination someday to try to uh, stop the cell-to-cell -cell transmissions? I think that that's what um, have been tried. And um, so I don't know, and some of you might remember in the late 90s, and um, Dale Shank from um, um, Genotech, and Athena, that's right, Athena. And so he basically um, developed an uh, active vaccine and then it went to clinical trial, but it caused cerebritis in some patients. And then at that time, it was just created an uproar and then the, the trial was halted. And I don't think that the field as a whole had gone back to for active immunization at this point. And it's mostly for passive immunization. Are there any clues from the epidemiology of neurodegenerative disorders as to uh, behavioral and environmental risk factors that either um, increase risk or lower risk. Yeah, so, um, so for Alzheimer's disease, I'm not sure that they're really, um, you know, um, um, I would say confirmed studies of, of um, environmental risk. But for Parkinson's disease, it's definitely true. I mean, basically, you know, pesticides and um, toxic chemicals um, and um, really promote the, or facilitate the formation uh, of, of, of Parkinson's disease.
So for that, I think Parkinson's disease has a strong environmental component, whereas Alzheimer's disease is still relatively unclear. Thank you.